Trossard. La pide la izquierda Martinelli. Está solo. El último toque de Trossard. Ahora suelto. ¡Saca! ¡Gol! ¡Gol! ¡De Bucayo saca para el Arsenal! This is Arscast Extra. Hello and welcome to another Arscast Extra, as always, with James from Gunner Blog. James, a very goodly morning to you. Goodly morning, Andrew. How you doing? I'm, I'm, I've got a cold, and a consequence of this cold is that my ears are slightly blocked up, so everything sounds a little more to the right than it mm-hmm. should, and it's also like everything in the world is underwater, you know? Okay. I mean, you're an audio mm. whiz. Can you not fiddle with the settings so, you know, turn up the left <laughs> in your headphones and achieve some equilibrium that way? I suppose I could do that, but it doesn't work in real life. Mm. You know, beyond sitting here with headphones on, it wouldn't, I don't have those kinds of settings for, you know, audio for the world, unfortunately. Right. I hear you. But it's I disconcerting, you. you know, everything yeah. sounds far away and weird and I don't like it. And to be clear, when I said I hear you, uh, that was just using it as a phrase of <laughs> colloquialism. I wasn't bragging or trying to run it. Yeah, I hear you perfectly in both ears. Yeah. I hear in, you loud and clear. Andrew. In Dolby stereo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I'm sorry to hear that. Funnily enough, as I sat down to start the podcast, I had a little pang of an earache. And I was like, oh, oh what no. that is? A bit of sympathy pain, maybe, for my friend. Maybe on the so. Other side of the Irish Sea. <laughs> um, how so. are you? I, I, at the ground yesterday, a lot of people expressed their condolences and well wishes and wanted to know how you're doing, how you're holding up. All good. All good. It's been a strange old week. You know, there's a big hole in the house where he used to be as well as a a hole in the heart where he used to be. But, you know, we're getting on with it and Lana's doing okay. She's she's a little less bewildered than she was. Um, But yeah, you know how it is. It's just one of those things. Life goes on and you have to, you have to cope. I did enjoy the fact that yesterday an archer scored at the Emirates. An archer said, nah, there's only one archer can make goals count at the Emirates Stadium. <laughs> Not having this. Hopefully his influence continues to shape our season. So far, it's been excellent. It's been disappointing not to hear Mikel Arteta give him some credit. You know, he talks yeah. about the difficult win start the to the this, season. Win that. Yeah. <laughs> Where's Archer's credit, damn it? Pacayo Saka this, Kai Havertz that. Yeah. Come on. Anyway, it's all good. It's all good, thankfully. And I had um, quite a sort of dramatic, well, dramatic, I don't know if that's the right word. I had a long trip to the stadium yesterday. How come? Well, I, I'd been away at a family wedding um, in Devon, which for those who aren't familiar with UK geography, Devon is kind of sort of the arse end of England, really. <laughs> it's about, it's not quite the first, it's not quite Land's End, but it's about as far away as you could be from the Emirates Stadium heading west. And um, we stayed over on the Friday night. And obviously I knew I wanted to get back for the 3 p.m. kickoff. Yeah. So I was like, right, be great if we could leave. I was there with Camille and the baby. I was like, be great if we could leave about 9 a.m. Mm-hmm. And that was very much the plan. And, you know, got up early, made sure everything was in order, had breakfast. But, you know, toddlers being toddlers um, and, you know, all things being an equal, I couldn't get him out the door. 
by 9 a.m. It wasn't possible. <laughs> he's uh, really small, though. Can you not just uh, pick him up? Yeah, you know, he's small, <laughs> but he is strong. Right. And strong willed. <laughs> and if he doesn't want to put a nappy on or shoes on or whatever it might be, he will run away. And that's just my luck, my lot in life. Okay. At this point in time. So I couldn't get out the door at 9 a.m. Listen, I'm not putting it all on him. Maybe there's some blame on me too. We did end up leaving about 10. And I was like, I've got to drive back from Devon. I've got to drop Camille and Rocky at her mum's on the way. I was like, I don't know if I'm going to make it. Um, so it was quite an epic sort of odyssey. I mean, when I say an epic odyssey, it was me sat on the A303 um, going past multiple service stations, <laughs> um, just driving in a straight line. But I eventually got back to London, got to the game and walked into the ground a mere six seconds after kickoff, which impressive I was over the moon with. Impressive. Thanks, man. I mean, I, you know, it was literally to the minute that we, I was going to do it or not. And it was quite, uh, I think my heart rate, I need to check my uh, wristwatch, but my heart rate in the sort of hour and a half before kickoff was probably even higher than during the game. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I got there and it's weird. Like I, you know, I like to get there early, soak up the atmosphere. Sometimes sure. I watch the warm up because yeah. I'm a little nerd. And um, yeah, I missed all that. Missed North London forever. But only six seconds of action, in which, as far as I could tell, pretty much nothing. I think Arsenal hadn't even had the ball yet. Right. Well, there you go. There you go. Perfectly timed. The universe Perfectly is timed. strange like that, isn't it? You know, just six yeah. seconds. A lot can yeah. happen in six seconds. A lot can happen in 90-odd minutes as well. And yeah. there was a fair amount went on in this game. And I suppose we should start with uh, team news. We might as well. Uh, or team news or the team selection that Mikel Arteta uh, went with yesterday. I don't think there was any surprise. I mean, given that you got there uh, six seconds before kickoff or six seconds after kickoff, mm. you probably didn't have any time to soak up the social media reaction to the team uh, being announced. With <laughs> oh, what a shame. What a shame. I know. Yeah, you missed out. Uh, Thomas Partey being at right back. And there was a lot of like, oh, my God. Not Thomas Partey at right back. And it's like, well, Ben White's injured and Jurian Timber's injured. And who else is there? Mm. Well, you know, Tommy I mean, Asu is, is one answer, but he was only just back himself. Well, therefore. exactly. Exactly. He's only just on the bench and got a few minutes towards the end. But I found it a bit odd. You know, like, I, I don't particularly like Thomas Partey at right back. But it's not as if he said to Timber and White, right, sit your arses down, I'm playing Thomas Partey ahead of you. He, he had literally no choice other than to play a kid, and I don't think he was ever going to do that. No, I don't think so. I mean, I was listening to the preview pod and you were talking through the options and you kind of arrive at the conclusion that yeah. Thomas Partey is the answer. Um, and I think if there was a game in which we could afford to have Thomas Partey at right back. It was probably a game like this, you know, a game in which we were likely to have vast amounts of possession. You know, he wasn't going to have to do a lot of uh, running in the wrong direction. Um, you know, he, he could basically sit in there and help out with the build-up, with his passing ability. That That isn't, you know, an aspect of the lineup that particularly alarmed me, I have to say. No, I wasn't alarmed at all by the lineup. I was quite intrigued, actually, that he went with... Raheem Sterling and and Gabriel Jesus, not least because of the form that Gabriel Martinelli and Leandro Trossard have been in, but but you know you have to you have to give players minutes, right? If you mm -hmm. want players to contribute over the course of the season, one of the accusations Arteta or made of Arteta is that he doesn't rotate sufficiently, he doesn't do it enough, he doesn't use the full depth of the squad, and then. When he does, and I guess, you know, maybe there's some post-match um, influence on how people think about those rotations because of, you know, the difference, I think, between Martinelli and, and Trossard and Jesus and, and Sterling in terms of what they gave the team yesterday and have been giving the team. But for me, it made perfect sense. Again, the kind of game where you're at home against a team that's down the table, struggling, likely to give you chances because of the way that they play. And if you're looking for a game where, A, you can 
use the full depth of your squad and B, maybe you can use it to spark a bit of life into Gabriel Jesus in particular and also Raheem Sterling who's a new signing on loan. To me, that made sense, you know, especially when you consider that we also, or we have in reserve, if it doesn't work out with those two, two players whose form is is excellent at this moment in time. So not only does uh, do you get an opportunity to, to sort of, have a positive impact on those two players. You have a fail safe in Martinelli and Trossard on the bench. Yeah, I mean, I think Mikel Arteta will reflect on this, sort of just sitting back slightly, as mission accomplished. You know, he rotated the team uh, and it was enough to get the win. You know, it didn't cause sufficient instability to throw the result off course. I think as fans, we're like, well, it would have been nice if the game was won by half time. It would have been nice if we didn't go behind. But I I think Arteta will reflect on it and say, I made changes. I gave people minutes. I had a look at certain players in certain positions. And ultimately, when I needed to change it, I was able to. And we got over the line. I hope that you know, a slightly sticky opening hour to the game doesn't sort of reduce his confidence in his ability to rotate because we are going to have to do it. We are absolutely going to have to do it, particularly over the next few months as the schedule really picks up, you know, fighting on multiple fronts. Um, This is going to be a feature of our season. Mm. And if you can't do it in a home game against Southampton, when can you do it? Well, exactly, yeah. Uh, I, I do wonder if some of the... Like I, I'd thought before the game about could Ethan Ranieri start this one? And I think yeah. in my mind, I thought he really could. I, I think taking Partey out of the midfield probably changed that. I just wonder if that was kind of a change too many, you know, to take mm. Partey out and then maybe uh, have us out of that area of the pitch as well. Um, but yeah, I was interested to see how Sterling got on. I thought this was a game he might well play. Jesus, it made sense, I suppose, to give him the run. I think as the game played out that was maybe the one where you know maybe we did miss Trossard most of all the players who were rested mm. um, certainly like in the North Bank around me that was a lot of the chat you know at half time there's a lot of oh we need to get Trossard on um, I think just because he's been so effective and so good for us in that yeah. role I mean, halftime was the the f- not the first time but it really occurred to me that we miss Martin Odegaard in games like this. Of course. You know? And I think there was an imbalance because we had to play Partey at right back. And I think he did his job fine, by the way. It's not a criticism of him, but he plays the role obviously very differently from from Ben White and Jurian Timber for understandable reasons. But I, it, it struck me that this was the game where we really missed the creativity of Martin Odegaard. And I think in, in many ways, Trossard has not quite... Um, picked up the bat on in in that sense, but I think he has been very influential. So you could see why we missed him. But it's worth maybe just chatting about Sterling and and Jesus. And I think they both had moments. You know, I don't think either of them were particularly brilliant, but they had moments mm-hmm. where, you know, on another day it could have been just very slightly different for them. Jesus had a shot, and I think Bednarek didn't even know anything about it. It hit him and deflected away. Another day that goes through the defender's legs and into the into the bottom corner. There was a there was one from Sterling actually, and it was one of the times when Jesus did really well and moved the ball quickly. You know, I think he's had a tendency of late to hang on to the ball a bit too much and take the wrong option, which we've discussed. But he moved it very quickly out to Sterling on the on the left hand side, who ran forward, ran into the box, cut inside. You could see what he was trying to do. He was going to curl it into the top corner. And a defender got there and made a brilliant block. So there was uh, something... Sort of headed it away. Yeah. Is that the one? Yeah. yeah, he headed it away. So I think there were some moments for those two mm. in this first half where, you know, their contributions might be looked at slightly differently. Although I think, you know, when we get, get to the second half, you know, you could see maybe the difference between uh, those two and Martinelli and Trossard. But it was sort of the story of the first half, wasn't it? A lot of Arsenal dominance... A lot of last-ditch defending from Southampton. I think you have to give them some credit for the way that they defended. Uh, Mm -hmm. Backs to the wall, you know, they made mistakes. They kept giving us possession, trying to play out from the back. But they would get men in the way. They would block crosses, block shots. Um, But we lacked just a little bit of cutting edge in that first 45 minutes, I think. Yeah, I think that's true. And, you know, when I thought about this game, I 
envisaged Aaron Ramsdale having to make a ton of saves, yeah. potentially. And he didn't really uh, across the course of the game. I know he scored three goals, but it's not like he was exceptionally busy beyond that, especially in that first half. Um, so I think we, we came out the blocks really strong. You know, in the first 10 minutes, there were sort of a flurry of possible opportunities. Sterling had mm. that moment as well where he intercepted a, a pass from Ramsdale and ended up going through on goal, you know, went down, but but nothing given. Um, yeah, it wasn't a penalty. I don't think. No, it wasn't. But, you know, there were moments like that. The Jesus chance from the cutback, the Sterling shot was blocked. There were little hints here and there, but... Um, Southampton defended sort of more stoutly than I anticipated. You know, I thought this game, we'd turn up and, and blow them away. And who knows, maybe if we get the fine margins in those first 10 minutes, we do. Mm. But we didn't. And, you know, then it got to about 15, 20 minutes. You haven't got that goal. Southampton picked up an injury, which in fairness appeared to be a legitimate injury. They made a substitution. Archer came on. And that took the sting out of the game mm. a bit, as it so often does. Um and actually, as I watched the first half play out, I, I didn't particularly feel that we looked likely to score. I think that it kind of, uh, it sort of slipped into quite a, a relatively sedate pace. And, you know, Southampton looked, maybe comfortable is, is too strong, but they looked, um, they didn't look on 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 the ropes, you know? No, that's true. You, you got to half time and you're trying to think, right, did we really test the goalkeeper? Yeah, And we didn't. You know, there were a couple of moments. And like I said, there was a lot of good defending from Southampton where, you know, there was a commitment to that rear guard action that frustrated us. Obviously, there were a lot of corners. There was, you know, Saka was getting to the byline. There was some cutbacks. There was, I think, a chance for Jorginho. Ramsdale did make a save from... Partey. As Partey, well. that's right, and got down. Um, you know, I think it was Sterling who was on the follow-up. So there were some some moments, but it did feel like something was kind of missing from from our attacking play. Um, I think so. And, and I think, I mean, that was quite interesting, by the way. One of the things about playing Partey right back, I noticed that we were able to sort of negotiate him into decent shooting positions a couple of times, arriving onto the ball from deeper. Um and his shooting was, you know, a bit better than it, it can be at times, certainly mm -hmm. that it was in his first season when he seemed to put it over the bar every time it came <laughs> to him. Um, I was it struck by what Southampton did on corners. You know, I, I, watching us sort of <clears throat> slightly toil to break them down in open play, I had a lot of hope in set pieces because we're just so strong in those areas. You said you thought we'd score from a corner when we were... Yeah, I chatting, did. Yeah. Well, it was. I, I found it interesting... In the absence of Ben White, I kept thinking, oh, who's going to do the Ben White job? You know, kind of yeah. put themselves around the goalkeeper. And, and I, nobody did, really. And I, I found that slightly odd. I think, you know, I think we've seen in the past that if you really crowd Aaron Ramsdale, you know, he can have issues uh, on set pieces. And I was really surprised that we didn't do more of that. Mm. I don't know if it's just because... You know, we don't trust anyone to to master the hashtag dark arts quite as expertly as, as Ben White. Um, Trossard does it a little bit when he plays, but obviously he wasn't in the 11. And and in response to that, Ramsdale decided, I'm going to come and get involved with these corners. You know, yeah. I'm going to come out and be a presence and get to things. And um, I think he did okay, actually, in that. Uh, you know, and I wonder if we'll see... If Ben White, you know, continues to be absent on the team, we'll see more goalkeepers say, well, look, if you're going to chuck balls into the back post, I'm going to come off my line and do something about it. Because mm. when they don't, and I'm thinking of people like Vicario, you see how we profit from it. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, second half then, Southampton had a couple of moments, didn't they? They they put one over the bar. There was a run. Tyler Dibbling, uh, who looks an interesting player, doesn't he? I thought exactly the same thing, yeah. Very interesting player. Just, I guess he's sort of from the uh, Jack Grealish school, from certainly in terms of the socks, down by the ankles, bit old school, you know what I mean? But quick. he's only 18. Now, yeah, so. yeah. Um, I watched him because what Southampton game was I watching? I can't remember, but I did watch United, him a couple of weeks maybe. ago, maybe, and was impressed uh, by by him and what he did and he's he's quite direct he's quick he's strong he had a mm. couple of moments in in the second half there was a shot um there was his yeah. cross that 
He got beyond Calafiore and put a cross in. He hit post with that shot, didn't he? He did. It deflected. I think it hit an Arsenal player and deflected off the outside of the post. And he, he blasted past Calafiore at the start of the second half. Mm. I mean, he's, he's a tall boy and very powerful runner. Um, yeah, I was impressed with him. Mm. But uh, yeah, that, yeah that, I felt like, I think Arteta said the same thing. I felt like, like we started the second half a bit sloppy and Southampton had their best spell in the game. Yeah. And they got their reward for it. They did. 10 minutes in, Raheem Sterling robbed in midfield. I think he wanted a foul. I'm not sure it was, to be honest. They got it forward very well. Are you there? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I thought you'd gone. It was just, no, this is just really. my hearing. Uh, I'm imagining things. <laughs> God almighty. Um, but uh, it came to Cameron Archer, who stepped inside William Saliba. I watched this again this morning. And at the time, I didn't realize that it had taken a little deflection off the underside of Saliba's foot. It does, yeah. And I did wonder if that may be wrong-footed, not wrong-footed Raya, but made it more difficult for Raya to get across and make the save. I think so. It sends it off into the corner. I mean, I, I've watched it a few times myself and, you know, you look at it, we know how good Saliba is in these one-on-one situations. I wonder how he'll reflect on it when he watches the analysis back. Will he think, you know, I wasn't tight enough to him when the ball was played. Could I have got closer? Could mm. I have closed him down? I imagine he will because he's he's so good in those scenarios and very few people get the better of him. But ultimately, is a bit unlucky because the ball comes off the bottom of his boot and skids into that far corner. Yeah. It felt, I don't know, the, I've, I've got questions about the defence, which I'm going to leave to part two. Um, but I do have okay. a, another sort of a point to touch on towards the end of this. But, you know, you're sort of like, oh, could this be a banana skin against Southampton again? They've been a bit of a bogey team for us for, uh, for a little while, for no particularly good reason, other than this shit kind of happens in football. And I was thinking, oh, God. Not again, you know, and I was thinking about the first half and the dominance and not scoring and like, uh, it was really important, I think, for us to get back into the game quickly. And that's exactly what we did. I, th- I think Southampton were only ahead for three minutes. Saka won the ball, made a, a good slight, well, what would you call it, a tackle or an interception? Mm. Something between the two. First time pass into Kai Havertz. I think what Havertz does is just superb. The kind of body shimmy to get away from the defender, takes it on, puts it outside him, and finishes with the kind of conviction that, you know, is night and day from Kai Havertz this time last year. It's amazing to see the difference in this player and what confidence and belief. And uh, it was interesting, Arteta talking about the game or talking after the game about how Havertz is a player who needs love. He needs a lot of love and he's got that love now and he's responding with, you know, a fairly emphatic finish, but one which I think said something A about him and B about his influence on the team, the way it sort of, it sort of said, okay, you've gone ahead. Well, here, have a bit of this. We're back in it now. You're going to have to deal with us. Yeah, it 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 is an exceptional finish. I may be forgetting something, but I think his best in an Arsenal shirt, unsavable, and the body swerve that he produces, as you say, when the ball comes across him, just to allow it to roll outside him onto his left foot, mm. um, is expertly done, and just yes, cracks it in off that near post. It's a an outstanding goal really reminded me of a kind of Robin Van Persie style finish. Yeah, you know, yeah. The way he would really put his foot through the ball and say, I'm sorry, keeper, you're getting nowhere near this. Um, and it's a mark of a player who's at the top of his game and feeling like, well, feeling every every one of those 65 million quid. Um, mm. And yeah, very important timing as well. I think Arsenal... It was interesting when, when Southampton scored an immediately chance, chance for Trossard. And I think that kind of triple change was already in the works. I think Arsenal yeah. were sort of preparing those guys to come on and have it scores. Um, and then the cavalry arrive, I think, two minutes later or so. And suddenly the momentum is with us again. Yeah, I was curious to see, you know, let's say Southampton hadn't scored. At what point would Arteta have changed it? 
would it have been on the hour mark? Was that, you know, his plan to to see what you know, uh, Sterling and Jesus could do um, mm, in 15 minutes and get to the hour mark and then make the change? But yeah, those guys were lining up before Havertz scored. And I was looking and thinking, right, will he change his mind on one of those now? Because it's a triple sub on the hour bringing on Marino, Trossard and Martinelli. Is there anything that he might change given that we've scored and got ourselves back in the game? But I think, you know, the the game at that point needed something different in midfield than Jorginho. And that's not a criticism. Uh, I just think, you know, we got to an hour. It was 1-1. We needed to go for it a bit. And I think he is a guy who can make way in those circumstances. And then Martinelli and Trossard for Jesus and Sterling just made perfect sense. And I think those two in particular completely changed the the dynamic of our attack. We felt more dangerous. We looked more, uh, there was more zip to our play. Like I think Sterling did fine, but Martinelli did what he did with a bit more oomph. I don't know how to describe it. He just seemed to move quicker and move the ball quicker and cause more threat. And you could see how lively he was. He was really, really buzzing around. Um, And of course, it was him who got the the second goal. Oh, man. I love this goal. I really love this goal. And so much of it is down to Bukai Saka. Not to take anything away from Martinelli. It's an excellent run and finish. But Saka's assist is a, a thing of beauty. Yeah. The quality of that ball, the timing of it, the quality of it, the height of it, the speed, just everything about it is is superb. And, you know, we'll, we'll come to Saka in a second, but it was interesting to hear Martinelli talk about how that's something that they've been working on on the training ground, that cross to the back post. Um, the timing of Martinelli's run was excellent. The finish very tidy between Ramsdale and the near post. And, you know... Is there something to be said for now that Martinelli has scored in a couple of games? You know, can we talk about maybe how even if Sterling wasn't brilliant yesterday, there might be something in the fact that Martinelli has that kind of competition on the left hand side, which is useful, um, you know, to sort of uh, I guess get him focused again on on providing that end product that we're looking for from players in that position. Yeah, perhaps so. I mean, I thought the position that he found himself in on the goal was was exactly what we want from him, you know, arriving in on the back post. And I think Arsenal, that's something they've really been working on, getting players onto those diagonals. I was struck as well by the fact that you look at the penalty box when Martinelli puts it away and, you know, almost on the edge of the six-yard box, you've got Kai Havertz, six foot four, Mikel Marino, what is he, six foot two, six foot three. You know, we've got a lot of presence mm. in the penalty area now. Um, but as for Martinelli, I was just really pleased for him more than anything. I, I think that there have been questions and doubts and people have looked at his record and understandably so. But throughout that, I don't think anyone's ever really questioned his character, his commitment, yeah, his work rate, his professionalism. In all those respects, he is absolutely outstanding and people who work with him day in, day out will all tell you that. So uh, I, I was, I'm really happy to see him getting the rewards now for his hard work and uh, the confidence to take that chance first time. I know it's, it's kind of, it's absolutely the right thing to do, but there was something very instinctive about it, which is mm. the mark of a player who's starting to feel himself again. Yeah, exactly. Confidence, as we just talked about with Kai Havertz, is yeah. a huge aspect to... Um, you know, to what a player can do on the pitch. And maybe we'll come back to that in, in part two with a question or two about Jesus, who, who looks, you know, like someone who doesn't have much of that. But Martinelli mm-hmm. getting back on the score sheet after scoring last week as well. It's very timely. We need that from him as well as all the other great stuff that you've been talking about. His his commitment um, to his defensive work is unbelievable. But if you're playing as a, a left winger, you need to score goals and make assists. And he's got himself back on on track. There were a couple of moments again for um, for Southampton. Uh, that shot that we mentioned that that took a deflection, hit the outside of the post. There was also, I think it was a corner where Raya came and didn't get there, and then it sort of bounced off a defender and up in the air. Mm-hmm. I have to say though, I think he was being fouled, the goalkeeper there, uh, as he yeah, was going for the ball. Yeah, I think that would have been a free kick. Yeah, having seen that back this morning, it, and ball ended up. I think it hit Armstrong, came off the bar, but I, I think I well. You never know in this no. day and age, but I'd like to think that wouldn't have stood. I don't think so. I don't think so. You never know, though. Um, 
it might be one of those or would have been one of those where it's uh, it's allowed stand because it's Arsenal. Um, hey, by the way, speaking yeah. of uh, VAR and officiating, there was quite a long check yes. on the Gabriel Martinelli goal. And for the second time this season, I noticed they, they sort of put up on the big screen the Premier League graphic of, you know, who the check is against, what's what's happening. And Gabriel Martinelli, at least that's what I thought his name was, <laughs> uh, was once again listed as uh, Teodoro Martinelli Silva. Theo. The new Theo, is that what you're saying? The new Theo, I guess. Yeah, Arsenal's new right. Theo. Um, um, yeah, I just thought that was interesting. And and on the subject of names as well, Mm -hmm. again, I don't know if I should be reading anything into this or not, but in the press office, when they handed out the official team sheets, um, Mikel Marino was just Marino. No Mikel. There can be only one Mikel. There can be, uh, yeah, maybe that's Mikel's <laughs> deem that the orders come down from on high. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's because he's a new signing and they hadn't set the typeface for him or God knows what, but he may have gone Brazilian. He may have downsized his name. Maybe so. Or maybe it's instruction. Ar- Arteta, you no longer have a first name while I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> there can be, only, like Highlander, there can be only one. Uh, it feels maybe. entirely plausible, just to avoid confusion. Yeah. Just get rid of Macau. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's impossible to know which one they're talking about when you're talking about one that's on the pitch. And, well, Arteta's on the pitch sometimes as well, isn't he? So uh, all those guys who talk about him being out of his technical area, maybe that's the consequence uh, of that. We did get a third goal, and I think we have to talk about Bakayo Saka and what an amazing uh, contribution he is making to this season so far. It is, in all competitions, seven assists and three goals. He has seven assists in the Premier League. He deserved a goal. This was a a slightly weird goal in that Havertz played the ball while lying on his back, uh, flicked it through to Trossard, who had Martinelli outside him. I think Trossard was really good yesterday, really impactful, but there were a couple of moments where I think just fell below his best level when it came to that final pass because normally Mm. he's so good there was one where he forced Martinelli just a little bit wide similar kind of overlap where Martinelli was to his left and he he played the pass just a little bit heavy in this uh, instance he took it on I think I don't know what happened I think he just sort of got caught in two minds didn't quite know what to do the ball bounced to a Southampton defender who took a heavy touch and there it was for Bakayo Saka to finish with his right foot Ramsdale had taken I think a step to his left Saka's first time shot um, to the goalkeeper's right made it really really basically impossible fantastic finish a goal he absolutely deserved and when you look at the numbers that he put up yesterday seven shots seven key passes 11 crosses um, finished the game with two assists and a goal He's just amazing. And I don't think we take it for granted by any means. I don't think anybody takes Bakayo Saka for granted, but I do think it's worth stopping once in a while when there are other players in the team who are getting their flowers. The consistency with which Bakayo Saka produces for this team is just unbelievable. And if others are getting their flowers, I think he deserves a big bouquet this morning. Absolutely. I, that was... I came away from the game just sort of marvelling at the impact he's able to have on games. Um, The numbers this season are extraordinary in terms of chance creation. Uh, I think he's right up there, not just in the Premier League, but across Europe. He's creating as many chances in open play as he is from set pieces. You know, it's not, his corner delivery is outstanding, but it's not just about that. He showed that the Martinelli goal. I'm glad he got the goal yesterday because he deserves... Uh, that reward for what he's producing for the team. Mm -hmm. I think we do appreciate him. We do know how good he is, but I do have the slight feeling that maybe outside of Arsenal, his talent is actually a little undervalued and underappreciated. Not that it should matter particularly, but I think he suffers a little from just being so ruthlessly efficient. You know, he's not a guy who pulls out step overs or flip flaps or drag backs because his play is all about efficiency. Mm. It's about how can I create an opportunity in the most direct dynamic way possible. Um, There's not a lot of ego in his game and yet he's still a star and we're very, very lucky to have him. 
Yes, I think he's absolutely brilliant. And he was brilliant yesterday and on a day where I think Havertz was outstanding again. That moment, like in 94th minute and Havertz, game is won, right? Game's over. We've scored the third. 94th minute, Havertz is battling over on the touchline to win the ball, play it back to, I think it was um, Kivior who was at left back at that point because Calafiori Mm -hmm. had gone off. You know, absolutely just sums up what he is about, you know, that kind of battling spirit and and how much he relishes that aspect of the game now, as he talked about in midweek after PSG, where he said he didn't, you know, previously relish the physical side of the game. I think there was a, a sense, and maybe understandably so, that he didn't necessarily use his size as well as he might. But I think we're seeing, you know, a different kind or a different side to Kai Havertz. I think that kind of commitment to your job, even in the 94th minute, is part of why this team is able to do what it does on days where it is a little bit of a struggle. We can dig deep. We've got the quality. We've got the reserves. We've got the ability to change games from the bench. But I think there's something about the mentality that Mikel Arteta has installed in this team from front to back that also plays a part in in maybe getting the most out of what a player can do on the pitch because you've un- unlocked something in their psychology in a way. I think so, yeah. And, and there's such an absolute commitment uh, from the team. They really understand the degree to which they have to work to secure the points they need. Yeah. And Havertz embodies it, I think, maybe more so than anybody at this point in time. Um, he is a player transformed and he is has become sort of the ultimate team player, really. Um, and I think that's a great expression of kind of the ideology Arteta's installed at Arsenal. You know, nobody uh, can coast in this team. And things like rotation, which we saw yesterday, help to maintain that environment where yeah. competition... Is so key. What was the word? I think Jordan Campbell wrote a piece for the Athletic, um, which revealed that one of Arteta's uh, kind of buzzwords is collaboration. Right? So, <laughs> co- <laughs> which collaboration and competition yeah. is the sort of spirit he tries to foster. London Colney, and I, I think the performances exemplify that perfectly. What's the Homer Simpson word? Christunity. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. One from. One out, one of that ilk. Yeah, something like that. Um, look, I think we deserve the win. There's no question we deserve the win. Um, you know, we made enough chances. Before we just talk a little bit about Aaron Ramsdale and his return, how do you think Mikel Arteta will reflect on on these two games against Leicester, against Southampton, where Arsenal were expected to win? Arsenal did win, but on both occasions have been maybe tested a little bit more than people would have envisaged, and maybe more than people would have liked, right? The Leicester mm. win was very late. And it sounds a little counterintuitive to to talk about this, given that we've scored seven goals in our, our last two games, right? Which is a pretty decent return from two games. But have we made the most of our dominance to manage games in the best way possible? Should we be, or should we have been as tested by these two uh, fixtures? Do we have to give some credit to the opposition? Is it you know, a consequence, perhaps, of what we've had to deal with in terms of injuries? Or will there be things that Arteta is looking at and thinking, OK, we, we need to do this a bit better. We've won the games. We've scored goals. Um, you know, we've put the opposition to bed, ultimately. But you know, I want us to do things a little bit better in, in future. I think they probably will, because he's a perfectionist. And he's always looking for how he can kind of, um, you know, tighten the screws on his team. Uh, What's your opinion? Do you think that he'll see room for improvement? Oh, yeah, I think so. Hmm. I think so. I mean, like I said, it it feels counterintuitive to say we need to be more efficient from an attacking perspective, uh, given that we've scored seven goals. But at the same time, I think you could look at that first half yesterday and think "Mm, that that was a chance maybe to go in a goal or two ahead and make the second half a little bit easier, you know, albeit we did that last week against Leicester and then made life difficult for ourselves again. I can't help but think that there is something to the fact that we've just had to deal with so much 
in terms of injury. We missed our captain. We missed Declan Rice for a, a, a game. We were without both of our fullbacks, uh, right backs yesterday. And I think it's fair to say that both of our right backs are absolutely brilliant and bring so much to the way that we play. You know, we've had to deal with a lot and I think there have been injuries and 10 men and there's been so much going on that I think we haven't quite been able to get into the kind of rhythm that we would like that ordinarily, I think games like this, I'm not going to say there would be easy because it sounds entitled to say that, but I think if we are in our full flow and in our full rhythm, I don't think either of these two games would, would have been as close, if that's the right way to put it. That may be true. That may be true. I do think that it's impossible to see them without looking at the context. Mm. Um, and I think the run of games that we've had has been really challenging. You know, we started with those three away games, Spurs, Atlanta, City. Then the sheer frequency with which we've been playing, we've had games against, you know, PSG as well. Um, I think that Arteta will... He'll doubtless have things that he'll want to do better, but I think he'll also be very proud and pleased with how his team have navigated this period. Sure. Uh, And I I am too. I think we've come through it in a really strong way. I guess it's sort of perfect, really, because, you know, we've picked up points. We're still in the the race. You know, we're on track, effectively. But we also have stuff that we can look at and work on and tweak. Um which you would expect as the season goes on. Yeah. Uh, I think Man City have set the model right, which is that first half of the season is a little bit about fine tuning and finding the formula. And then it's after January, really, that, you know, you just are on a roll at that point in time and have to just continue to to build and build momentum and keep the run going. Yeah. Um, We've kind of had to uh, rejig the recipe a little bit, haven't we? Without Odegaard, without, you know, um, some players here and there. And White's been absent quite a lot. He's been a really, really important player. I mean, you know, imagine if I told you that Ben White and Martin Odegaard were going to miss, you know, as as many games as they have. That right-hand-sided combination of them with Bukayo Saka has been absolutely integral to everything Arsenal have done over the last two years. And in fact... I guess that's another feather in, in Saka's cap. Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah. He continues to perform even without, you know, those players who've been such key, played such key supporting roles yeah. for him. Yeah. He's, yeah. I'm not lost for words, but I think I've said everything I need to say about just how uh, relentlessly brilliant Bakayo Saka is. Let's, before we go to the break, just ha- have a moment for Aaron Ramsdale. Obviously, an emotional day for him back at, at Arsenal, having left in the summer and, you know, the, the end to his Arsenal career was a little bit sad. Uh, I don't think anybody's at this point um, doubting the decision to go with, with David Raya. Nevertheless, you know, when Ramsdale signed his contract, it would have been May last year or the year before. No, it was May of last year, wasn't it? Um, you know, he talked about wanting to you know, be at the club for a long time and, and the connection between him and the fans was always quite... A special one, I think, even if, you know, when he was on the bench last season, there was a lot of focus on him and it wasn't helpful. But I think that connection with the fans where having overcome that that scrutiny before he signed for the club, he became very much a favourite, didn't really have a chance to, to say goodbye. And I think he got a, a great reception yesterday. Easier, of course, when your team has won, but I think it was a, a nice day for... Uh, ultimately a nice day for him in the sense that he got that uh, opportunity to say goodbye. Um, He won't be pleased about the result or being beaten three times, of course, but, you know, on a human level, I think it was a nice day for him. I think so. He gave a good interview, I thought, to BBC Sport in the week in the run-up to the game where he spoke well about the situation at Arsenal and um, it was particularly interesting about the kind of TV coverage, his frustration, you know, with them constantly showing him on camera every time something happened with Raya uh, and vice versa. Um, but he got a great reception. He managed somehow to not celebrate Southampton's goal, which must have taken an extraordinary restraint. I didn't how, didn't see that. Yeah. yeah, how we know he usually likes to react. Um, and the last couple of minutes of the game, really, we had that lengthy stoppage time period, nine minutes or so, and the last two minutes certainly around me, was an opposition 
player's name being sung. Uh, I mm. don't recall that too many times, uh, you know, in my in my time at Emirates Stadium. So it was a very warm welcome, and uh, we shall see him again. The last game of the season is Arsenal away to Southampton. Oh my goodness. Mm. Mm. Lost narrative there, potentially. <laughs> potentially. Let's hope it's all done and dusted uh, at that point. Yeah, we'll yeah, be over the, the line. Hopefully. Yeah, exactly. We'll we'll have it wrapped up in April and we can coast our way through May. I think that's the, uh, that's the way to look at it. All right, we're going to take a little break here. We'll come back with your questions and more in part two right after this. Welcome back to the Arsecast Extra. This is part two of the show where we answer the questions that you sent to us on threads at Gunnarblog and at Arsblog. Also on the Arsblog Discord chat server, which you get access to if you are an Arsblog member on Patreon. Can I go first? Do you mind? No, by all means. All right, here's a question. This is a big one now, all right? And we talked about Bakayo Saka in part one. But yeah. Danny Nick 8 asks, Hi, gents. Will Bakayo Saka beat Thierry Henry's Premier League assist record this season? What is it? Is it 20? Oh, man, that's a big number, isn't it? He's already on seven. Thierry Henry assists record. I'm just going to double yeah, check. It's 20. Yeah. He also scored 24 goals. So he was directly involved in 52% of Arsenal's Premier League goals that season. It's almost as if he was quite good. He was quite good, wasn't he? Mm. I, listen, 20. So he's got to get 13 over the next, how many Premier League games 30, remain? 31 games. So approximately an assist every three games. He could. We don't need any of your could bullshit. Will he or won't he? We've got to be definitive here. He says, will he, not could he? I'm going to say that he won't. Mm. I'm going to say that he won't. I just think that this run he's on right now is absolutely incredible in terms of assists. But I think that over the course of the season, his numbers will balance out more. There'll be more of a spread of goals and assists. Um and I, I'm not sure he'll get to 20. I, I, the reason I say that is I remember Kevin De Bruyne getting incredibly close to it a couple of times and just not quite getting over the line. And uh, much as I would love Saka to to go one better and actually do it, I, I think it's a high... It's an, it's, it's an absurd number mm. from Omri. Okay. But listen, I mean, if certainly if it carries on like it, like he is currently, he will. Do you think he will? I think he will. Great. I think he will. I just think there's something about Saka this season where I'm not going to say he has matured into his final form or something like that, but I think he has gone up a level again. And I think we are looking at a player whose ability to produce is in the very, very top echelons of what we see from professional footballers. Don't argue with that at all. So I think that he is more than capable of producing 13 assists, maybe, well, 14 to beat it, but I think he's more than capable of producing another 13 assists in the next 31 games. So all going well, touching wood for availability and all that, I'm going to back Bakayo Saka to beat that record this season. That would be an extraordinary feat if he does. Mm. Like I say, some great players have tried and failed, or come close and not quite managed yeah. it. Um, and it would be fantastic if the record was broken and it stayed at Arsenal. Mm. Uh, it could happen. Could happen. could happen. Can I follow up with one also just sort of in the Saka ballpark? It yeah. comes from Freddie LJ on the Discord. He says... Um, I don't know who he's talking about here. Uh, people like uh, a, an Arsenal reject and a Spurs mouthpiece making statements that Saka's not world-class, but Palmer is. I don't know. Oh, who I, I do know. Who's that? Uh, it's Jamie O'Hara. Well, Jamie O'Hara, yes. Oh, he is an Arsenal reject, is he? 
He was. I think he was with the academy at some point in time. Ah, I thought he was talking about an Arsenal reject and a Spurs mouthpiece. Oh. So like Jamie O'Hara and some other twat. But it's Let's just check this out. Two twats in one. That's all. Yeah, he yeah. was. He was. It's two twats for the price of one. Yeah, he, right. he was at Arsenal's academy between ninety eight and two thousand three. Okay, perfect. I just thought he was talking about somebody that you know uh, we were not to name. Um, anyway, but he says Saka being not world class, but Palmer is. He says, is there a way that you can see media being less driven by trolling and return uh, returning to sort of more educated slash less controversial opinions? What do you think? Mm, I think it's out there. I think, I think it is out there. It just probably makes less noise. And I think that we, everyone, you know, you, you can kind of tailor your coverage, right? Like if you're listening to this, you're probably choosing to do so over listening to Jamie O'Hara's show on TalkSport, for yeah. example. Yeah. And I think you, you sort of vote with your feet or with your thumbs, rather. Um, I think there's always going to be, the way that digital culture works, there's always going to be that kind of amplification of more extreme viewpoints. You know, the hot takes yeah. are always going to do well. But there's so much, there's, there's also more in-depth, brilliant coverage of football than there has ever been, in my opinion. I think you're right. The The unfortunate thing is people very, very rarely, and this isn't to be critical, but I think you very rarely see somebody screenshot a paragraph or take a clip from a podcast or whatever and say, this is actually really good analysis. This is a brilliant yeah. piece of uh, writing, whatever it might be. Whereas a twat like Jamie O'Hara saying Bakayo Saka is not world-class and Cole Palmer is, is essentially trolling. That's what it is. But people react to that and then they screenshot that and go, look at this idiot. Look what he's saying. And other people go, God damn, that idiot is an idiot. And it's true. He is an idiot, but everyone knows he's an idiot already and we don't need more evidence of his idiocy. That's but, it. I mean, that's how know? it proliferates. But I suppose what I'm saying is, and I, I, I'm aware this may be easier said than done, but like, can't we just ignore Jamie O'Hara? Like, can't we all just get on with our lives and be like, fuck this guy? Fair point, well made. Like, I, I, you know, I think it's incumbent on every individual to an extent. I, I know it's annoying when things are noisy and you go on social media and your feed, the algorithm is feeding you stuff that's deliberately provocative, but we just have to try to aspire to a place of being more zen and not mm. being provoked by wind-up merchants yeah you know? well that's what he is yeah that's true but that's his business mm -hmm. right um but that's all he can do yeah it is all he can do and it's sort of extraordinary that you can make a living from that but I guess I sort of feel like, but where's the pride? Like, does Jay... <laughs> <laughs> where's this going to go? <laughs> Just got visions of uh, Jamie O'Hara's great-great-grandchildren <laughs> stumbling upon TalkSport. But I'm se I am I serious. Like, I'm not, I, 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 won't, I won't do it fully, but like, what, where, you know, when Jamie O'Hara looks in the mirror, is he like, I'm doing a good job here? I don't think he cares. I think there are some people who exist in a world without, like I'd always be careful about what I said and how I said it because I would hate to be uh, misconstrued or, you know, I, I sort of, I kind of care what I put out into the world, mm. you know, as you do and as many people who talk about Arsenal and, and even people who are have jobs in the media, they care about what they say and how they say it. Whereas some I people what, don't, yeah, I, you know, there, there is no shame, like, He's probably been on some terrible reality TV show. You know what I mean? He yeah. doesn't. Well, he played for Spurs, which is kind of the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, shit island, I think he, he probably thinks. <laughs> he probably thinks. Well, I'm getting paid. You know, uh, at the end of the day, I'm I'm doing well out of this. Mm. Jokes on everyone else, and he's perfectly entitled to think that. But the price for that is that everyone thinks you're a fucking cunt. Yeah. <laughs> so he, you know, it depends, doesn't it? Mm. I don't want to be one of those people that people, you know, I don't want everyone to think 
that of me. But he's nailed his colours to a big mast, and the mast has a sign on the top, and it says, I am a fucking cunt. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, is that fair? I think that's entirely fair. And I think we've now spoken uh, enough about him. We've uh, given it too much oxygen. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ignore fair them. Enough. Ignore them. Yeah. We know I mean, Bakayo Saka is world class. And Cole Palmer might be too, you know? It doesn't have to be. Well, also, it doesn't matter. Either. What does that even mean? Yeah, He's yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. It's mad. And maybe Cole Palmer is good. I think he's really good. I think he's excellent. Unfortunately. And maybe Bakayo Saka is also good. And that's okay. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I wouldn't do well on TalkSport, Andrew. No. Unless my show was talking about other pundits. Because <laughs> well, I've got some spicy takes when it comes to that. While they're sitting right in front of you as well. Yeah. That would be amazing. The Jamie O'Hara and Gunner Blog show. <laughs> <laughs> but why do you think I'm a fucking cunt? Well, yeah. it's because you're a fucking Well, cunt. I, listen, also, in fairness to TalkSport, I gather they've now got an... An Arsenal specific show. I saw they had Clive Palmer That's on there. That's right. The other yeah, day. I saw that. I saw Darren that. Ben and Julian Laurent. Um, and I, I heard it was line. quite good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I look forward to my invitation. I guess <laughs> <laughs> it must be in the post. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, no doubt. All right, your question. I think. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is from uh, GS. Three seven Guna. Mm -hmm. Goodly morning, gents. Simple question: What is Kai Havertz's ceiling? And I don't think he means in his house. Like how has he decorated it? I think he's talking about his potential as a footballer. Um, good question. Good question. I think when he was younger, there was a lot of talk about how how good he could be. Obviously, and then he went to Chelsea and. Sure. Look, Chelsea was... can happen to anyone. Yeah, it's pretty much happened to everyone, uh, given the amount of players that Chelsea have signed. It didn't go well for him there. I think he's been rebuilt. He's like the $6 million man, you know? Steve Austin. He's come he to fine. Arsenal. Mikel Arteta says, we have the technology. We can rebuild. how he can run all the time. He's unbelievable. His engine is just incredible. Um, what he gives to the team in every game. Like, I know he's... Sometimes he's not the tidiest on the ball, but I think what he gives to this team is just outstanding, a different a different level to where he was when he arrived, obviously. And I think Arteta said after the game, he can go to a different level again. I know there was a bit of scrutiny on him when he talked about how he wanted to score 20 goals this season for Arsenal. And it was like, oh, well, that's a nice ambition, but can Kai Havertz really score 20 goals? But when you look at the stats, the stats doing the rounds, aren't there? In the last 20 games, he's been involved in a goal in every game or something like that. It's something ridiculous. Um, I think he can get better. I think he's heading into his prime years. And I think he has been basically rebooted at Arsenal. You know, a new, better Kai Havertz. Kai Havertz 2.0. And I'm here for it. I really, really enjoy watching him play. I don't know. I Like, we talked about it when he signed. And we talked about his start to his Arsenal career. And we had some concerns. And we had a, a little bit of worry, you know, that it wasn't necessarily going to work out. But how can you just look at this guy now and not fully enjoy what he brings to this team? You know? Even if you were skeptical back then, I think you've got to eat a little bit of humble pie today. Definitely. Definitely. And, and to be fair, I think uh, the way in which we use him and the way in which he's applied, the team has adapted to him as well, right? There's been a kind of mm. coming together there and Arteta has been quite open about that, about how there were adaptations made from maybe how he initially envisioned using the player. Um, but he's been brilliant. What's his ceiling? I honestly don't know. I use this quote a lot, but I always remember Arsene Wenger saying, you should never put a ceiling on anybody's potential. Um, and, and I think that's right because footballers, athletes continue to amaze you. You see things from them you d didn't expect or yeah. didn't think they were capable of. And I think the biggest catalyst to that is confidence and self-esteem. You know, obviously the technical work matters, obviously the physical work matters, but that psychological component is so 
enormous, particularly, I think, for strikers. Um, so what is his ceiling? I don't know. We might be at it. You know, this might be Kai Havertz at his very, very, very best. And if it is, fantastic. I hope it lasts. Yeah. Um, but just like Bukai Saka continues to climb, you know, rungs up the, the footballing ladder, maybe Kai Havertz can do that too. I think the type of player he is, yes, he works hard. Yes, he covers a lot of ground. Is he reliant on blistering pace? Not particularly. You know, is he at an age where his tactical understanding of the game continues to improve? I think arguably that's one of the strongest parts of his game, his positioning, his movement, his interpretation of how players is developing. There's no reason that shouldn't continue to get better. You look at someone like Thomas Muller, his compatriot, and how he continued to perform and excel like into the later stage of his career, arguably to get better and better too. Havertz could be similar in that regard. Um, I don't know. I'm excited to find out. But I think I think his form and his performances raise interesting questions about centre-forward and, you know, what Arsenal might do in that position moving forward, you know, in future windows. It's very hard right now to, to look out there at Europe or, or the world and see many centre forwards you'd want above this Kai Havertz in this team right now. Yeah, I think we've got to the point where it's not necessarily who should play ahead of Kai Havertz, but who do we have in reserve? Or who do yeah. we have as a, an alternate to Kai Havertz rather than is Kai Havertz good enough? Here's the stat um, from Statman Dave. Uh, he says, Kai Havertz has now been directly involved in 20 goals in 20 Premier League games as a striker for Arsenal. He's averaging a goal or assist every 82 minutes in the Premier League as a striker. There is, I think, probably a little grey area as to, like, was he playing as a striker yesterday completely? I'm not sure. Um, yeah. But he finds himself in those positions. And, and just sort of going back to your point about his tactical understanding of the game, is this not one of Mikel Arteta's great strengths? In, uh, in that he is able to, how do I put it? unlock things in players or their understanding of the game. Mikel Marino midweek saying he learned so much, you know, about uh, the tactical aspect of the game and Arsenal's system in four weeks while he was injured. You know, this ability to get players to understand the game and understand their roles within games is, I think is one of Arteta's great strengths. I don't know if you saw match of the day or the match of the day analysis, but they were talking about how Rice and Jorginho would press at certain moments in the game when Southampton were trying to play out from the back. Right. And it's almost like when you see the two of them move, it's almost like someone has pushed a button to make those two players move in tandem at exactly the same time. But what they're doing is they're, they're seeing what Arteta and what the coaching staff and what they've worked on on the training ground, that A, when A happens, you do B, right? Yeah. And it's fascinating to watch it. And, you know, you're talking about players like Jorginho, who's been been there, done that, worn the T-shirt, you know, uh, in a very long and illustrious career. You know, that tactical understanding of the game, just playing out in simple moments, the coordination of movement as we try and win the ball back high up the pitch. To us, you know, I know there are people who watch the game through a very tactical lens. I'm not necessarily one of those. But when you see the positioning of the players and the way that they move and the, the, the way that they stay organized on the pitch, I think with Havertz is a great example of, of that. You know, it does speak to what Arteta is doing with these players and, and how the clarity of instruction makes it, I'm not going to say easy, but you can see how it is for them to, to carry that out on the pitch. Absolutely. And I think we recruit for it as well. Intelligence. You know, intelligence, yeah or a willingness to learn. You know, we've signed some more experienced players uh, who have a brilliant tactical understanding of the game. Jorginho, you mentioned Mikel Marino when Narteta was asked the other day, what does he bring to the team? That was the thing he emphasised above all else. You know, his intelligence on the pitch, his mm. ability to implement different tactical ideas. And then you've got guys like Kai Havertz or, or Declan Rice who arrive really hungry to learn. I think Califiori, Timber, they would be in that camp too. Um, 
to absorb as much information as possible to make themselves better players. Mm. Trossard, another example of someone who arrived maybe more fully formed, but just had a very, very good tactical understanding of the game. It's not just technical and physical profiles uh, we recruit for. It's a mental one as well. Yeah. And we've done really well in that regard. Um, um, is it your question or my question? Or I don't know. No, it's my I've question. Got, because Oh, go on. Oh, no. Well, if you've got one, go for it. It's from Tio. And they say, goodly morning. Calafiori's runs forward are amazing. But when he runs back or defends, his pace seems less impressive. Is this any concern? Yeah, I saw a few questions about Calafiori, actually. Um, Another eye-catching performance. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, Dwight the Beats asked a similar question on the Discord. I've noticed people getting in behind Califuri a few times. Happened once in this game, which led to a Southampton chance and happened a couple of times in the PSG uh, game too. Is that a worry? I mean, maybe, but also it could be something that is worked on in coaching in terms of positioning. Maybe it's a consequence of how he plays and how front-footed he is, that when he tries to attack and intercept and win a tackle, somebody can get in behind him. I don't think he's necessarily the world's fastest fullback by any means, but a lot of that can be worked on with positioning, body position in particular, when you're defending, uh, when you're facing up against the player. You know, how can you... How can you make it difficult for them to get beyond you? So I think there is still something quite raw about Califuri. Mm. I think there are things that he can do better. There are things that can be improved on and things that I think will be improved on. But I watched him yesterday and was just so impressed again. The the way he the way he looks so comfortable. We talked about him last week, talked about him and Timber last week, so don't need to go over that uh, again. But you know, some of the tackles he makes, there was one where Ball, I think it was first half, Ball was cleared down the right-hand side, big long clearance from Southampton. Don't know if it was from the goalkeeper or a defender. It was a really high ball. He was running back towards our goal, took a touch with the ball coming over his head, went into midfield and made a pass and just it was just brilliant what he can do on the ball and with the ball is unbelievable i i take the point that there might be things that he can uh work on defensively um but he is 22 he is still relatively young for a defender he has played a lot as a central defender more than a fullback and i think fullbacks are more likely to get exposed with quick wingers running in behind them than center half so i'm sure that's not lost on Arteta and the coaching staff when they analyze the games, you know, where, where was there maybe a little weakness or a little bit of a, an issue? I don't worry about it too much at this stage. If in six months or a year's time, this is still a problem while he's playing at left back, maybe we have to have a different conversation. But at the moment, I'm not that concerned about it. Well, also it's the question of sort of balance and does the good outweigh the bad, the positive things he's offering? I don't think he's been poor defensively, but I completely understand, you know, the question is that suggest there have been one or two moments of vulnerability. I think he's a player who plays on the front foot. There's an element of risk to what he does. Some of the positions he takes up, you know, leave not vulnerabilities, but certainly gaps. Um, but at the moment, I, I, I'm more kind of taken aback with the sheer force of his personality and the way that mm. he expresses himself on the ball. I think in the absence of Martin Odegaard, you know, creativity is a, a, a subject of discussion for this team, but I think creativity can arrive in all sorts of ways. Um, and I think the way in which he approaches the game is incredibly creative. Yeah. You know, the, the imagination he shows in terms of his use of the ball, the, the positions he finds himself on the pitch. I think that is lending an air of, unpredictability to the way we play, mm. even though he's ostensibly a defender. Uh, and I think that's a really exciting element for this team. Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, I had a question here and we had a number of questions. Um, where was the first one? Why can't I find anything? It's because my head's underwater. Um, Queen Gunnar on threads. Do you think we'll ever see a pre-injury Jesus again? And also on the Discord, uh, TK underscore Samuels, another frustrating game for Jesus. How much patience do you think Arteta will have with him finding his form? And realistically, is he going to get many choi uh, many opportunities to find it? 
I, I don't know. I think as fans, it's so tempting, isn't it, to draw conclusions and have this kind of finality around players. You know, when they're out of form, they're done. You know, they're yeah. never going to find it again. Then they, you know, one of those shots goes in and suddenly they look a bit of a different player. I, I just think at the present point in time, he seems to be suffering for confidence. Um, mm. uh, will we see it again? There's every chance. I think the difficulty he's got is that I think his route to the first team is quite blocked at this point in time. I think as a wide player, we've spoken about Martinelli, we've spoken about Saka, Trossard's in contention for those positions. Raheem mm. Sterling now is in contention for those positions. And through the middle, Kai Havertz has made himself the man. I think as soon as Martin Odegaard's back, he'll resume responsibilities as the centre forward in this team. And I think what Trossard has produced has moved him actually ahead of Jesus now in, in the pecking order. And I think I could say that at this point in time with some confidence, you know, if Havertz isn't there, uh, it's a big game. I, I want Trossard in that false nine role. Um, yeah. So the the problem for Jesus becomes, can I get the chances I need to find that rhythm, to find that form? And that would be my only sort of concern in terms of whether we see him at his best again is, is he going to get those opportunities? Uh, I'm not so sure. Mm. What do you think? It's hard not to worry, you know. Um, mm. It's 21 games without a goal now. Um I don't think he's ever been quite the same physical presence as he was before that World Cup injury. Yeah. You know, because one of the things that really struck me about him when he first arrived, like I know he was an upgrade on what we had at number nine previously. Like Lacazette was not really physically at it for a while. And Jesus was much more mobile, much quicker, better in the air. But his strength, I think, was impressive as well in that opening period of his Arsenal career where his ability to hold off defenders, bring others into play and, and set attacking moves going was really important to the way we started that season. I think people overlook because maybe the end product, I think he maybe five goals, five assists in, in the time that he was... Um, fully fit before he got that injury at the World Cup in 14, 15 games. So it was pretty decent, but it wasn't brilliant, brilliant uh, in terms of goals. And that worry was was always there. But that ability doesn't seem to be there anymore. And I don't know if that's a physical issue, if defenders or other teams have just worked him out a bit more. I don't know. Um I mean, he was at Man City for a long time, so they've had plenty of time to do it. But I think at the heart of it is it's a confidence thing where he was brought in to be the Arsenal number nine. He gave us a lot in that position until he got injured. I'm not sure he's ever been physically quite the same since. And he's lost his place. Like yeah. that place is now Kai Havertz. You know, with everyone fit, Kai Havertz starts up front. And I think you're right if... We had a game tomorrow and Havertz wasn't there. Who would you want in that nine? It would be Trossard ahead of Jesus at this moment in time, simply because of, you know, the end product. Jesus doesn't have any at the moment. I think he badly needs a goal or two. And I think that's part of why Arteta started him yesterday, hoping that against a team like Southampton, who who can cough up some chances in their uh, final third because of the way they play might give Jesus a better chance of getting a goal, but you know, ultimately it didn't happen. And I think it will be another day where I'm not sure his confidence will take a, a hit because of it, but it certainly wasn't restored in any way. No, no, I think that's true. Um, what about this? We, we've done well in the Premier League, but we're not top of the league. Um, and Speckled Jim says, what kind of deal have Liverpool made with the devil to get those first seven fixtures? Um, I don't know. They've done well. Lost to Nottingham Forest, but generally they've they've done well. It's we've more, got them soon, right? Yeah, I think second game Our back, is it? next home game, yeah. Yeah, next home game is um, Liverpool. So, yeah, that will be a big test for them. I think that will be a... 
a better indication of where Liverpool are. I think they're a good team, though. They were a very good team last season under Jurgen Klopp. Um, they look to be going well under Arna Slot, and they've got a lot of attacking threat, Liverpool. You know, they really do. Um, do you think they're title contenders? Because, you know, I feel like when you're in the race with City, there's so much focus on on City, but... You know, do you find yourself looking at Liverpool results as well? Yeah, 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 for sure. Why not? They were in it last season until, what, the last six, five or six games? Yeah. They were there yeah. thereabouts, you know? So they were part of the title race last season. I think they'll be part of it again this season. I think maybe defensively, they haven't been properly tested yet this season. Uh, they've got an injury now to Allison, by the way, which I think is going to be uh, a pretty big, a serious one for him. He's going to be out for our game, so that'll be Creeving Kelleher in goal. That. Yeah, Did he pick that up during the game yesterday. Uh, I think so. I think I saw a quote from Van Dyke basically saying he, he picked up a hamstring injury again. He just recovered from one. So, you know, I, I don't rule out Liverpool at all, but I admit they haven't been as properly tested as as you would have liked. It has been a favourable fixture list. Ours has not been quite as favourable, and I think that is a, a positive thing. You know, for us to come through those opening fixtures, what are we a point behind? I don't really look at the table this early in the season, but no, no. So it's uh, let's have a look. Yeah, seven games played. They have eighteen points. Us and City have seventeen. Yeah. Um, obviously, if Chelsea win today and Aston Villa, they'll both be on sixteen. So okay, it's, it's tight. Who are Chelsea? It's, uh, early days. Playing, like Chelsea playing Forest. Aston Villa playing Manchester United. Slam dunk win for Aston Villa there. You'd imagine. Yeah. yeah. Jahan Duran will fucking spank one in from 48 yeah. yards. Bring, bring him on after one minute. You know, <laughs> so good off the bench. Just get him on after one minute. Imagine how many goals he scored there. Yeah. He's, he's having quite the run. Okay. What about this from a couple of uh, questions about this? Just W. Bennett on Discord. Uh,. What do you feel has happened to our defence generally this season? We've conceded three sloppy goals in two in the two easiest fixtures on paper, and it's been discussed multiple times that Raya has bailed us out in games. What we all thought was contextual based on tougher opponents seems to be a bigger pattern at the start of this season compared to our solidity last year. And Cheech uh, says, is our lack of clean sheets at home something to be worried about? Right now, it seems like Raya will not be in the running for the Golden Glove again. Hmm... Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, we controlled the game against PSG really well at home, I thought, and mm. defended very well in that second half. Uh, in the Premier League, we haven't found it quite as easy going. Um, I don't have a sort of magic bullet answer, really. Uh, do you have any inkling as to what might be happening there? Uh, I just think... When you're trying to deal with all the things that we've been dealing with this season, you know, playing with 10 men a couple of times, dealing with injuries, having to rejig the team and reshape the team and play players, maybe not in their ideal position. You know, I think of, um, you know, Calafiore did really well at right back, but, you know, Partey at right back, for example, not his mm -hmm. natural position. I just think we've had so many things going on that it has had a little bit of an effect on the stability, the defensive stability of the team. I think we've been unfortunate a couple of times as well. So I don't think it's really something I worry about a great deal. I think what was obvious last season was there was a huge amount of consistency in our team selection. Um, I know as the season went on, left back became a, a bit of an issue where there were players coming in and out. Um, but we've missed... You know, the solidity of Ben White. We've missed Jurian Timber. I think Jurian Timber plays uh, the right back role a little differently from Ben White as well. And there have been other factors that have maybe destabilized the team to an extent, which could explain the goals that we've conceded. But the flip side of that is that we've coped really well. Um, with those uh, challenges and with those absences, even if we have conceded a few more goals than people would like, we're unbeaten this season. We've won a lot of games. We've drawn a couple, but we've won a lot of games. And I think that is that is the thing I would take away more than defensive instability. It's our ability to cope, even with a bit of that in our game, and get results. 
And I think that speaks to the sort of progression and the maturity of the team for me. Yeah, and I think on the instability front, I think the best I can sort of offer really is the idea that we've not had our first choice 11 available all the time. Yeah. You know, and I don't just mean in the back four. I think a player like Martin Odegaard is very, very good defensively and affects how we control games, you know, the degree mm. to which we manage possession, for example. Um, we haven't had Mikel Marino available, which would put Declan Rice in at number six, which I think defensively will improve mm. us. So I think there are, you know, factors to do with availability that, that have maybe impacted on us there. I don't look at the individual performances of Saliba, Gabriel, Raya, and think they've significantly dropped off. No. Um, I think there are probably wider issues in the team that hopefully will be ironed out as the season goes on. Well, what about this slightly in the same ballpark? Char Gui on Discord. After seven league games, we apparently have the same record, the exact same record as last season. What does that say of our evolution, given that we've played much more difficult games this season? I think it's fantastic. Like I said at the top, I really do think mission accomplished of this little period between international breaks. Mm. We've had huge games and we've come through them in a, a really strong position in all competitions. And there've been some really positive stories among there and great moments. You know, I'm thinking of the late win against Leicester or even the Carabao game, you know, which obviously gets a bit lost in the shuffle, but seeing Ethan Aneri get his chance and, get a couple of goals. Miles Lewis Skelly playing in the Champions League the other night. Um, obviously, you know, the brilliant defensive performance at City, the good attacking performance we showed against Leicester. I really, really do think this has been, uh, you know, a month or so in which Arsenal have demonstrated a really wide array of credentials and nothing I've seen has dissuaded me from the idea that, you know, we could do it this year. We could do something really big. Um, what did you make of Saka after the PSG game when he was asked if, if um, you know, they felt, I think it was Thierry Henry on that CBS show who, who asked him, you know, do you think this is the year? And he said, yeah, we all think it could be, you know, this is the year. What did you make of the answer? What did you make of the honesty of the answer? Like he said, we, we all hope it can be. But I think you, you kind of need that inherent belief, don't you? If you are going to go and win a title, you have to believe you can go and win a title. Yeah. And I think it takes the belief, like the true conviction, a little bit of time to catch up with the potential. You know, Arsenal could have won the league two years ago um, had things gone a little bit differently. But did that squad, did that group really feel they were ready I'm not so sure mm. and I think having come so close twice I think there is a feeling like it's our turn it's our time and I think that's maturity as well I think this don't forget what a young group this was and some of those players are arriving at a time in their life where you know they're proper adults at this point in time and they they know what they want and they yeah. have a degree of confidence in what they're doing. Um, and, and Saka is, is one of those guys. So I like that. I like showing that confidence and thinking, why not us? Mm. Um, and that's a view that's not biased or Arsenal centric or that's something that's shared. You know, if we do turn on the radio or turn on the television and listen to mainstream media, there are plenty of other people out there who think Arsenal can do it yeah. or Arsenal will do it. Um, so it's a very, very exciting time in that respect. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, have you got one more? Uh, I've done the Liverpool one. Um, we sort of covered them really. I had a few like Cal about Calafiori. Is he the new, is he the Italian Nuno Tavares, but good? Uh, that's uh, what Andrew Allen said on the preview podcast. So it's catching it, right? on. Yeah, yeah, there yeah, you yeah. Go. Um, Jack Abella asking the same question. Pyro Guna, how long will it take to un-Chelsea Sterling? Um, mm. Don't know. Don't know, but we successfully un chelsea Kai Havertz, so anything's possible. Uh, you got one there? There was one about Declan Rice. Um, oh, yeah. From Plastic 
No, no. So Declan Rice is having an inverted commas slow start to the season by his very own high standards. Do you have any ideas why this is? Is it being the left eight versus six? New teammates on the left side playing next to Partey in a double pivot? I can't personally put a finger on why his performances are somewhat underwhelming. And I'm just curious as to what you think about that. Yeah, I had a moment in the game yesterday. He was trotting over to take a corner right in front of me. And I was like, oh, there's Declan Rice. And I sort of was like, oh, yeah, Declan Rice plays for Arsenal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whereas I feel like at this point last season, after every game, we were just eulogising about how extraordinary he was and what an incredible signing it had been. And my suspicion is that he probably hasn't changed that much, but the novelty has slightly worn off in terms of how he's perceived and analysed. Mm. That said, I, you know, I don't think he's at his 100% best level yet. Um, and I think that's maybe to do with playing in a midfield that's had to be reshaped, had to be reworked, that isn't isn't in its final form, mm. I think we can safely say. Um, and I think we can only really start to judge then. I think he's been good. I think he's done lots of Declan Rice things. I think he's been physical he's won the ball he's protected the back four he's worked hard he's carried the ball um scored a lovely goal didn't he in the in, in the Carabao game mm. some great set piece delivery as well but I think maybe we're just a bit more acclimatized to it um I think that's it exactly yeah yeah um, I think maybe there is a bit of a drop off from some of his very best performances last season it's hard not to think there's just maybe a bit of a post euro summer I think that would be hangover. Natural, it? But I, yeah, like you, I think we've basically become not inured to Declan Rice just being really good. Um, I think he can play better than he has done, but I don't think he's been bad by any means. And um, yeah, I think that's kind of all there is to it, that he set a very high bar last season and is maybe a little bit below that. And I think as football fans, we 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 have to find something to worry about. You know, mm -hmm. we always have to find something to worry about, um, which isn't to say it's without merit, but I don't, again, I don't have any really big, big worry about Declan Rice um, and what he can contribute to this Arsenal team. You see the moment yesterday where the referee <laughs> made him, uh, wanted to check that the ball was in the quadrant for the corner. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the referee came over and went, is that ball in? And he went, yeah, it is. Look, I'll move it. And he moved it. And it didn't go anywhere, and it stayed in exactly the same position. And he just took the corner. It's like, what was dark the arts, corner? Andrew. Dar yeah, 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 yeah. Every little bit we can wring out of the dark arts. That's quite <laughs> light dark arts, though, I think you would say. <laughs> yeah, light dark. <sighs> light dark arts. Okay, we will leave it there. Um, get this podcast out to you all to listen to. Hope you have a fantastic Sunday. We are heading into an interlull, of course, but we'll do our best to keep you entertained. Join us tomorrow for a look back at all the Premier League action in the 30 over on Patreon. You can join up if you like, patreon.com forward slash arsblog. For now, though, thank you very much indeed. Oh, by the way, if you would like to give us a review, you can leave reviews in all kinds of podcast apps these days. So if you'd like to give us a nice review in, in your favorite podcast app, that would be very welcome. Uh, um, we haven't asked people to do that for a while and it always helps get the show a little bit more visibility so if you could take a moment to do that give us a nice review that would be very welcome for now though take it easy and we will catch you on the next one bye bye <laughs>